The biggest takeaways from week one of fall camp. The corners are great, the running backs are right behind them, and there might be a surprise starter on the offensive line. That's coming up next. You are Locked On Irish, your daily podcast on the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's going on and welcome to Locked On Irish. Today is Tuesday, August 1st, and thanks as always for making this your first listen of the day. You can watch the show on YouTube or listen wherever you get your podcasts. Whether you're watching or listening, I appreciate you tuning in, and this is your reminder to please subscribe if you have not already. I'm Tyler Wojcik, and I'm the host. I graduated from Notre Dame in 2018, and I've been covering college football as a producer ever since. First for ESPN and now at Fox Sports, which is where I've worked since the fall of 2021. I've also been podcasting about the Irish since 2020, and that is why I'm here with you today. It was a big weekend on Notre Dame's campus. Fall camp is obviously in full swing, plus one of their biggest events of the summer with the Grill and Chill Cookout. A bunch of top targets in the class of 2025, plus some committed prospects in the class of 2024 as well, made their way up to South Bend for the event, and by all accounts, it was a major success. Then on Monday morning, we got the green jersey reveal for the Ohio State game, and I gotta say, I really like the green jerseys. I don't love the green pants as much or the cleats. I would have preferred gold pants and white cleats, but this is such an improvement compared to the green jerseys we've seen in the past, so I'll take it. Then, once the evening came around, Ross Ellinger from Sports Illustrated broke the news that Notre Dame is, in fact, going to re-sign with Under Armour in a new 10-year contract that is believed to be the richest apparel deal in college athletics. So, there's a lot going on right now in the world of Notre Dame athletics, but for today's episode, I'm going to be joined by Tim O'Malley from Irish Illustrated to recap week one of fall camp and go over some of the key developments he's seen before things really get rolling here once the players go full pads and actually start hitting each other. I'll share my thoughts on the Under Armour deal and the green jerseys more in tomorrow's episode, and I'm hopefully going to have another recruiting insider come on the show with all the scoops surrounding the Grill and Chill event later this week. So make sure to subscribe so you can stay up to date on all of that because we've got a lot of content coming your way this week and all season long on Locked On Iris. All right, let's bring in Tim. All right, I'm here with Tim O'Malley from Irish Illustrated. And Tim, you've seen at least a portion of four of Notre Dame's five total practices thus far. What's been your biggest takeaway now that we're almost a week into it? Yeah, we haven't had any hitting when we've been there. Our, our full practice was the first one, so there's really no contact. Uh, we will see that on, I believe, August 8th or 9th, we a full practice um, with some some serious pads and hitting, I'm sure. Uh, so that said, cornerback entered camp thinking it was a strength. Now I think it's more of a strength. Uh, running back, I think, I, I want to be clear about the backup running backs and how much I've liked them. I love them because Audrick Estime is the starter. I'm not sure I would say that Notre Dame would have a tremendous running back room if Audrey Gustin wasn't the starter. But the fact that Jadarian Price kind of beat him out last year before he got hurt, and we know how good Estime is. If he, Price did he be- really beat him out? So every coach we talked to is like telling you, man, Jadarian Price is our best running back. He's our best running back. He's our best running back. And then that happened. Now, it was a real thing that happened. He ruptured his Achilles. It's not like he missed yeah. a year for some other reason. Um, so having him there at any capacity of being as good as he was last year, even if it's mid-October, would be great. And Devin Ford looks quicker than I thought he would. Jabran Payne is a guy I'm writing about today in Monday Musings. I wasn't sure what his role would be. you got to remember that Dylan McCullough recruited him to IU and then away from IU to Notre Dame. That is the running backs coach that obviously likes something he sees there. I think he likes his versatility. And Jeremiah Love's just super fast. And you got to find a way to get super fast on the field. So I like those positions. Cam Hart is the guy that stands out the most. It seems so strange to say that a fifth-year senior who was always in good shape and always a good player looks different. Cam Hart looks like an NFL player on the field right now, and he's their second-best corner. So I I love the corners. I love the running backs. And hopefully after August 8th or 9th, if we talk, uh, I can say the offensive and defensive line can, can join those groups. Yeah, we've spent the last seven months basically talking about all the things we think we know about this team and all the questions we have. But as you know, a lot of that goes out the window or can go out the window in a hurry uh, once camp starts and you get a better look at these guys. So with that in mind, has anything jumped out to you that maybe you didn't expect going into it? You know, I, I was just trying to figure this out for for writing the story. Um, the linebackers are kind of what I thought they would be. I like the linebackers more than others do just because I think Maris Leofau won't be used the same way. I think they'll use his strengths. And Bertrand and Kaiser are very good. Um, I was really worried when Jalen Steed was not there for practice number two, but it was, it was, I mean, he's fine. He's, he's back. And Al Golden talked at length about the ways they can use Jalen Steed as a backup. I think that's a great role for him. He can be rushing the passer. He can play some Rover in base. 
I think that's important because I don't know who the rover is. I don't know a rover on this team because Jack Kaiser's moving to the weak side. I always think the rover is basically the nickel these days, which is Thomas Harper. So I think the versatility they might have um, in the front seven is something I wasn't really expecting. Uh, I am sticking with the fact that until I see them pit and until I see them go against the offensive line, they have eight really, really good backup defensive linemen. Only four of them have to start. So we will see what that means. I know it sounds harsh. I just think that if you had, let's say the 2018 line, okay, only one of these guys would start. So that's all I'm saying. If you're looking at playoff expectations, they don't have Tillery, Aquara, Kareem. But they have eight guys I think can really, really help. Yeah, I want to talk more about the defensive line, but you brought up the linebackers, and it's funny because you know, sometimes the conversations around fall camp can get repetitive year after year. We end up talking about the same things a lot of the time. But honestly, I can't remember another season where there's been so much talk about the backup linebackers, not the starters, the backups. And I get it. It's just an observation I, I had. Um, but which backup linebacker do you think is going to see the field the most this season? And at So I think position? it will be Snead. I think it will be Snead. I'm a little higher on Snead than uh, I, Kevin Sinclair and Tim Priester. We voted on Irish Illustrated this year for the countdown. I'm a little higher on Snead than they were, um, just because I feel like you can find a niche role for him. Where Ziggler is like J.D. Bertrand's backup. Somebody, you know, if you have Drake Bowen, even if, he, if he's at Rover or Will, he is the backup player there. Zinter, I think, is another year or so away. Osbury's interesting because he's a Rover. And as I said, I'm not sure they have a Rover. The weird thing about Snead is Snead kind of mentioned in December, he doesn't, the hardest thing for him is coverage. And we're like, oh, yeah, well, covering the slot can be hard. He's like, well, covering the tight end can be hard too. It was like a, a very self aware moment for a Rover. But I mean, that's what you do when you're the Rover. Yeah. So I, I think maybe people have taken that and run with it. I think he will find a role. Um, yeah, the, the the linebacker thing is just the strangest. I don't, I guess because you don't know the warts that exist for the young guys yet, but you do for Jack Kaiser, J.D. Bertrand, and Maris Leofau, that people will always want the new guy to come in. That's the nature of the beast. The shiny new toy looks great. Um, it's kind of like Clarence Lewis, right? Clarence Lewis is going to have a role. He's not going to start, but people don't want Clarence Lewis to have a role because he's been around for four years. If that guy was a freshman, they're like, oh, he's going to be great. <laughs> but that's just yeah. not how it works out. for or the Matt program. Salerno. <laughs> yeah, so Matt Salerno on the way out today beat Benjamin Morrison in a one-on-one round. I want everybody to know that, and I, I think the internet will explode. As I was typing it, I was laughing. They you know, keep what, very mad at this happening. What is it going to take? What would Salerno have to do this season to turn around some of that fan sentiment about? I mean, I, like, I think he could score like multiple touchdowns. He, this yeah, year. he'd have to be Chris Fink light, right? Because Chris Fink was yeah. Chris Fink was. Better, I mean, in practice, Chris Fink was better than Salerno. Chris Fink became a real, yeah. I mean, a, a legit two-year starter at Notre Dame. I don't think he's that good. But Brayden Lindsay told me last year, he's like, Salerno's not a walk-on man. He's just as good as the rest of us. Now, they only had like six wide receivers. Yeah. But no, that Matt Salerno will bar. not be the last guy. He will not be the last guy in. I absolutely promise you Salerno is in the too deep, not only on paper, but in reality. This episode is brought to you by eBay Motors. For a championship team, it's all about making sure every player is a perfect fit. It's the same when it comes to your vehicle. Every part needs to fit just right. So, the next time you need parts and accessories, head to eBay Motors. With eBay Guaranteed Fit, you can be sure every part you need fits right the first time around. Just add your ride to my garage and look for the green check to know the part will fit or your money back. Because just like in sports, confidence is the name of the game when you shop on eBay Motors. And with over 122 million parts to choose from, 122 million parts you'll be back in the game in no time after all it's easy to bring home a win when the right parts are guaranteed get the right parts the right fit and the right prices on ebaymotors.com let's ride ebay guaranteed fit only available to u.s customers eligible items only exclusions apply the current defense feels like the opposite of what we've become accustomed to because right. the best teams in Notre Dame recent memory usually had a great defensive line, but corner wasn't the strong suit with the exception of like Julian Love, Kavari Russell. But now Notre Dame's loaded at corner, but the defensive line is a concern. And I think Al Golden could try to alleviate some of those issues with the pass rush by sort of leaning on those cornerbacks, playing more yeah. man coverage, which went, would then allow for more blitzes and then hopefully more pressures. So how do you think they'll try to maximize the skill sets of Benjamin Morrison and Cam Hart? Because Notre Dame is kind of an uncharted territory right now. It really is. It's. Um, I was trying to think of it. I mean, back in 2002, it was Vontez Duff and Shane Walton, but Notre Dame had 11, maybe 12 total defensive players that could play. So anytime somebody got hurt and you saw that happen later in the year, they were really in trouble. But Walton yeah. and Duff were awesome. I think, I don't know, Hart and Morrison will be the same type of players because those guys were gamblers and thieves and they were tremendous at creating havoc. Um, 
coming up with turnovers, whether it was fump, stripping the ball, recovering it. They're scoring touchdowns on those things, picking the ball off. I think Morrison and Hart are better at straight up coverage. Um, I really do think I can't recall two lockdown corners. I know pride and love are really good together. I would have never called them complete yeah. lockdown corners. I would never really. have called pride a lockdown. Yeah, he's but good. he was a very, I mean, he's an NFL player. He's a, yeah. he's a very good athlete. Um, this is intriguing. And Cam Hart is only there because he got hurt. It's, you remember when Cam Hart got hurt in the Boston College game? He I mean, he was going to take a shot at the pros. He was very honest about it. He's like, I'm back because I I had to come back. And uh, I think it really helps Notre Dame's defense this year. And Jaden Mickey, it's interesting. He had such a great spring last year as an early enrollee. And then we started hearing whispers in August, like, hey, he's not he's not playing the same. And we were really surprised. And then it turned out, I mean, I, I know he went against great players because his, his mistakes were against Ohio State. USC and a little bit BYU, but I think Jaden Mickey can be a really good third corner for them too. It's going to be an interesting, not a nickel, but a third corner. I, I think what they can do with that secondary is going to help everything else defensively, but you still have to stop the run on first down. It's not like the secondary stinks if it's second and three, no matter who's back there. Right. Yeah, I get that. And you and your colleague, Tim Priester have written a lot about the different variations you've seen on the defensive front. And I know it's early. Al Washington is trying to see what he has with his entire unit, but based on what you've seen so far, has anyone separated themselves among the top eight guys on the defensive line? I mean, I know Priester really likes what he's seen from Riley Mills. Remember, we haven't seen enough yeah. hitting yet. Uh, right? He likes what he's seen from Riley Mills. I was waiting to see Javante Jean-Baptiste do something because somehow every time I went in the spring, he was either on a slow, like a veteran day, relaxing, or uh, the blue goal game he barely played. The full practice I went to, he barely played. Talking to Al Golden, Golden said that Javante Jean-Baptiste has kind of distinguished himself. And I know they really like Osafa Mensa um, as a leader and a player there. But Jean-Baptiste can get to the quarterback. I think Osafa Mensa is more of a strong side end that kind of holds the point um, and helps you against the run. So I do think there'll be a tandem there. Uh, Riley Mills and Gabriel Rubio is a guy we all think could have a breakout year. He's actually the highest rated defensive lineman on the team if you go by recruiting rankings which is interesting um he missed his freshman year uh, other than john baptiste because ohio yeah, state yeah. 27 of those guys every year that they're higher yeah. than yeah but rubio's 117 that's the highest other than john baptiste i do like the one-two punches all the way across uh jason anye i don't want to overdo it because he's an in incredible shape at nose tackle which is not something you say about nose tackles <laughs> And he's going to use quickness at 294 pounds to make plays as a reserve nose tackle. And the guy's just a very likable student yeah. athlete, for lack of a better phrase, when you talk to him. But he just seems like a difference maker in terms of other that reserve line. Like Howard Cross is the starter. Howard Cross is a fast veteran nose tackle. He's not going to get beaten out. If Anya can be really good and you have a one-two punch across the board there and get something out of the Vipers with Botello. Tui Halamaka and Burnham. I think that's the position that's the the one that I just have no idea what's going to happen. Those three. Um, it could be a really good defense. It's just a weird thing. When you lose Isaiah Foskey and Al Washington says, well, that's kind of the nature of the Viper position. We want to move guys from linebacker to Viper. Do you? Or did you just lose Isaiah Foskey? And that's why yeah. you're moving guys from linebacker to Viper. So I think we will see uh, if the versatility of those linebackers at Viper really plays out. Yeah, would you rather have a converted linebacker or Keon Keeley? I yeah. think it yeah, probably exactly. Yeah, no, Keeley. exactly. I think, <laughs> I think it, when you look at your roster, you're like, well, this is the nature of the position. Of course it is. It has to be the nature yeah. of the position. But uh, so I, I like the versatility, though, of those players. So if Patello can get to the passer on third down, that changes everything. I, I, it's just, I just wonder about the base defense, how they will hold up at Viper. Yeah, I was thinking about that. Are we underrating Jean Baptiste because Patello being the starting Viper and the sort of unknown with him yeah. because he's shown flashes. He did it in the bowl game. Um, he had a couple sacks, but he just really, I think he was ninth on the D line and snaps last season, which was pretty shocking considering right. the expectations for him this season. Whereas like Jean Baptiste has done way more in his college career and he wasn't even the starter at yeah. Ohio state. So that, so that's encouraging to hear about Al, Al Golden saying that he separated himself, but you just haven't seen it yet. No. And we just, we barely, we haven't, I don't think we've seen a one-on-one -on -one. Yeah, because uh, the first practice, they're they're really not going at it that hard. It's really hard to watch the defensive line. I thought, actually, I'll tell you what, from the first practice where you're not allowed to tackle, but there is contact, they did do they did do 11 on 11. It was mostly passing because if you run when yeah, you can't tackle, it's be, kind of pointless. Um, 
I thought Rocco Spindler looked good. And I know that there is a, I think we must be contractually obligated to mention him on every podcast for everything we do, Rocco Spindler, until he either plays or doesn't. So I saw, now today was five segments. I am positive, this might just be alternating days, that Rocco Spindler was with the ones. Absolutely positive. Now, maybe they alternate every day with Christophic and Spindler, because we talked to Joe Rudolph, and he said, yeah, it's a really good battle at left guard. Eric Hansen uh, actually asked him, what are you looking for to differentiate? And he asked my question, will you use them both? For some reason, I have been under this thought that maybe they will both play a lot, kind of like uh, Christophic and Spindler or Schroth yeah. and Spindler? Christophic and Spindler okay. on the right side. I think Schroth will win the job on the left side. Um, Christophic and Spindler on the right side. I think it's a battle. He said, you know, no matter the one thing he Rudolph said that I found interesting was they always say, like, you have to be assignment correct and you have to be consistent, technically sound. Of course, your coach, you say that. He said, it doesn't matter how assignment correct you are if you can't punch a hole in the defensive line in front of you. And I feel like Christophic will be assignment correct. So if Spindler can be, he's the guy that can punch a hole in the line in front of him. And I just, it, the Spindler Fisher thing on the right side, I, I kind of see. I'm not I'm not one of the people that always makes apologies for Rocco Spindler. Okay. He was way far away from playing the last two years when everybody said he should start. He was nowhere near playing. But even Joe Rudolph said he spent his first four spring practices. So these are first four times Rudolph ever saw him on the ground. And now they joke about it because he's so much better. So I really think he's moving up. And that could be like the mid-camp development where you hear Rocco Spindler could be the guy finally after three years. And his third offensive line coach. If you think about it, yeah, that's a lot to ask of any yeah. of any player, and that would be quite a surprise because it seemed like everyone sort of penciled in Chris Savage. Yeah, he's a, he started before. He's a veteran, and he'll do he'll do fine, right? I, I mean, he'll definitely do fine. He's not gonna yeah. he's not gonna be a bad player in there. It seemed like he Stan wasn't the biggest fan of him. I uh, agree. He never <laughs> he would never mention him. He would never mention. That's he would so go through the whole list, and he would say something about people, and then that would be it. He basically gave a player the silent treatment publicly. And yeah. Just, okay. <laughs> normally, normally, you just say something. Oh, and he works really hard, yeah. or something like that. That's that's so wild. Okay, if the cornerbacks have been the most impressive group so far, it seems like the running backs have been a close second. Uh, we've already talked about Audrey Esme. Yeah. We know what we're getting out of him, but you've raved about Jeremiah Love a lot in your practice reports. What is it about his game uh, and just him physically that's so exciting? He's different fast. Like, I've never said this about Chris Tyree. I know Chris Tyree is incredibly fast. I never looked at Tyree in practices um, and thought, whoa, that's just different the way he runs. I did I did think that about Lindsey, and of course it took Lindsey a while to get going, but I remember watching the guy, and Will Fuller, you're like, holy cow, that guy, when he moves. That is what Jeremiah Love looks like to me. It's second step, and he is full speed through a hole. So I want to go with what Marcus Freeman said. We asked him about all the new guys, and he immediately brought up Jeremiah Love. And he said, clarity equals velocity. It's the best line I have heard. In other words, you could be super fast, but if you don't know what you're doing, you're not going to play fast. I feel like with all these running backs, you can find a role for Jeremiah Love that doesn't include having thinking about pass protection and all the things they have to do in this world. It's not rocket science. Let's get the fastest guy on the team the ball once in a while because he has other guys that are better than him as running backs. Just find a way to get him the ball a little bit during a football game. Okay, put on your coaching hat for a second. Uh, how would you utilize Love's skill set this season with the understanding that he still has a long way to go uh, in terms of developing into an all-around back? Just this Yeah, season. I mean, if he, if he can run the way on jet sweeps and on end arounds and delays the way he does when we see him playing running back, I would use him there. Now, obviously, kick returner and punt returner are possibilities. Kick returner has been devalued so much in college football. I think you could put him back there, though, because it's not a ball security thing. I, I just guaranteed a fumble from the kick returner, obviously, when I say that. Hey, it's Tyrese Jake. had a big fumble before. I he remember that right. Cincinnati yes. game. He's had a big <laughs> fumble, too. So I, it's not a ball security thing at kickoff return, though, right? It's it's punt because you can muff the punt so easily, and, and great players muff yeah. punts. I feel like Jeremiah Love at kick returner is a definite option. Uh, punt returner, my guy, I love Great House at punt returner because I don't think you need 75-yard returns. I love – a guy that catches the ball, makes one guy miss, runs through a couple tackles, and gets about 15 yards. It's almost like it's almost like an old day Zibikowski thing. If you throw out the wonderful USC return, you know he would always he would just fight for yards and get yards. Uh, I thought Chris Fink did a good job of that, and Kyron Williams they would get 10, 12 yards. I am I get it that you don't want Matt Slurner returning punts. I, I understand that that's probably not the way to go for Notre Dame fans, but he's a good wide receiver, so get him in there. I don't think Zibikowski knew that you could fair catch 
until maybe <laughs> or that you could dodge or that you could dodge guys either he, he was yeah to I, hit somebody. Did, was it the stanford game when he finally took a hit that was i think he was concussed and then yeah. after that he started a fair catch it a little bit more so yeah that'd be great to see love uh what about the other running backs you, you kind of mentioned him a little a little bit jadarian price i know that dila mccullough said he has specific things he yeah. likes each of his running backs to do uh but he never really expanded too much into that what do you think he means by that what have you seen from the other running backs that you think that they could all contribute this fall well that's why i think pine or pine excuse me that's why i think that's ptsd that's why i think jabram Payne will find a role because um mccullough even mentioned last year when he wasn't playing he's like i know jabran can protect again he can protect against blitzes i'm like how do you know that's interesting that from just from practice and maybe from recruiting him i could see him as a third down back um Tim Priester, when he interviewed Marcus Freeman, I don't know if you know this, I was stuck in Aspen on a vacation. I got yeah, stuck. both the interviewing Marcus Freeman. My interview was set up for like a month. Oh, you actually were stuck. Oh. <laughs> I was stuck in Aspen, yes. So I did not get to go to this, but Freeman told Priester that Devin Ford is a very good special teams weapon too. So I think Devin Ford is going to be on all four coverage and return teams in some way. I think you'll see him out there. And he's just a veteran guy that could be the – you could list him on the depth chart as number two, even though he wouldn't have the second most carries. Does that, I mean, the depth chart is going to say this, Audric Estime, and then it's going to say Jadarian Price or Devin Ford yeah. or Jabran Payne. I think Devin Ford actually is a guy they would trust to do a lot of things if Estime went down. I just don't know if uh, the upside's there like I see for Price. Um, I think they will all find a role. I'm hoping Love finds a role. I know it's, we are five practices in, and uh, there's been freshmen before that look great. Like Lawrence Keyes looked phenomenal in 2018 for 10 practices. And then the guy apparently hit a wall that he never recovered from because he just never got back in there. But I think this is a deep group and they can augment each other for three months because of four months, if you include August because of that. Um, but once again, I don't want to stress. I don't want to overstate the running backs. They are. I like the group because estimate exists. Okay. Without estimate existing, I would be concerned that they would be relying on Janarian Price coming back from injury, a Penn State's third string running back, and Jabran Payne, who would not be at Notre Dame if not for Adila McCullough. That that's that is the reality of the position, too. Yeah. Well, if SMA gets 200 carries, then a lot of this isn't going to matter as much uh, as right, we might think. Right. Well, I was I want to ask you about the freshman wide receivers. But now that that Lawrence Keys comment just came up, I'm almost a little gun shy because look, the they freshman, good, yeah, they, they were the talk of spring ball. Have they been able to keep the, mem the momentum going now that they were uh, in fall camp? Yeah. And we have to wait till about what, the 15th before that wall comes right there where they hit the proverbial wall. I think Great House and Flores were just advanced for freshmen coming in as early enrollees. Um, now remember keys was not keys and Wilkins came in there together in the, in the summer. I mean, I, I wonder if great house is the fourth receiver. It's either him or Colsey. Maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe they go four or five and then Salerno six. Can Rico Flores be the six instead of Salerno? I don't know. He's a, I think if you're looking for more than 12 catches for Flores, that you're probably crazy, but great house could, I mean, great house could be a, third down guy on this team he just carves out space he's a great route runner you know obviously tremendous spring and a great blue goal game and we should never overrate the blue goal game as pete sampson said to me on our irish illustrated insider podcast if tobias merriweather was with sam hartman and Jaden greathouse was over with tyler buckner he might have had one catch and merriweather might have had 10 catches but i do like the way greathouse carves out space runs routes great hands and i think i didn't know this uh because he was a great athlete but I guess he needed to lose some weight. He was about 212, 211, and he's down to 204. He reminds me when you look at him of a like upperclassman James Onowalu. Just a big, strong, sturdy wide receiver. Obviously, Onowalu became a linebacker. He won't be 204 his whole career because when he starts lifting and growing, he's going to be a big dude playing wide receiver. I think he can be a weapon with Sam Hartman in the passing game. And that leaves me, interestingly enough, I mean, when you talk about freshmen, is Dion, where's Dion Colsey? Is he going to pick up where he kind of left off with Drew Pine? He's such a mystery to me. I feel like he's, I, I don't know this to be true, so I shouldn't say it. Is he always fully engaged in football? I mean, you just can't, I, I can never tell if Dion Colsey is fully engaged in becoming the best po possible wide receiver he can be. I know he's an interesting guy to talk to. I know he's a good student. I know he's going to graduate from Notre Dame. I just want to see Dion Colsey, he should be able to, take the bull by the horns and play over these freshmen at this point. He's an experienced guy and he, he's such a good weapon on third down last year. I think they could use that Flores. I loved in recruiting because he was a natural pass catcher that gets open. I think he'll still do that. And then Braylon James, we actually heard basically everybody, if I tell you the truth, heard bad reviews about Braylon James, that he was nowhere near the other two. 
I have since heard that he has really improved over the summer while gaining weight and keeping his speed. He needed he needed to put on weight. He's put on 20 pounds since like back in December. But 10 had to go on. Like he he physically could not have been out there at 180. Now he's almost 200 pounds. So if Braylon James comes through too, I mean that's that's a heck of a recruiting class. There's no such thing as three straight hits in recruiting, but they don't have to do it the first year, right? That can be down the road for Braylon James. Yeah, exactly. And if anything, maybe Braylon James gets like a Chris Brown type of appearance yes. his freshman season where right. he comes in. It's like, hey, you're fast, be fast, and maybe catch this deep ball. But At Clemson, you may- right? That's what you're thinking? At Clemson yeah. to steal the game? Ohio good. State. Ohio State Ohio wouldn't State hurt fine. either. All three. USC, too. Just three games. Three <laughs> catches, three touchdowns, 225 they'll, yards. That's they'll fine. never see it coming. Um, we, we had our first Sam Hartman mention, I think, 25 minutes into the podcast. Nice. That feels sacrilegious. I know that you haven't been able to see a ton from him, but how different is it watching him and his command of the offense and the rest of the team compared to what you saw from Buckner and Pine in last year's fall camp? Yeah, he's just so, so much better of a pure passer than either one of them. I mean, it's the ball comes out fast. It gets there better. His placement's outstanding. Um, Pine actually had pretty good ball placement in, in I don't want to say drills, that's that's not accurate in uh, in one on ones and stuff like that. But he would get enveloped by the defense. You used to see the def- the defensive front seven just make Pine couldn't see over them. He had he and he wasn't qu- if he could run like Tyler Buckner, Drew Pine probably would have been a pretty good weapon in college football. It just he didn't have that type of athleticism either. I think I made a joke that it's nice to watch practice and not wonder if the quarterback can complete a slant to air. Uh, but that's where we are. Sam Hartman, Sam Hartman can throw the ball. Uh, Steve Angeli, I have to admit, I thought Kenny Minchie would beat him out. Steve Angeli was impressive when we watched that full practice. We have not had a chance to look at them. They're throwing when we're usually we're walking out when they start throwing against corners. Um, I thought Angeli looked really good. He outran Jalen Sneed to the sidelines in the first practice. Heard I'm not sure that, that yeah. went over well. Yeah. But uh, I never, I was never super high on Angeli, um, but I thought he looked good in that first practice. So I'll be watching him closely. It's also nice not to think about who the starter is. Like, yeah. Spence is what 2019 with Ian Book that you're 2020, I guess, with Ian Book that you didn't know who the starter. Yeah, pretty much. And you actually said something on one of your recent podcasts that I thought was really interesting. You mentioned Will Fuller looked awful in practice before he oh. had a breakout sophomore season. Yeah. And it's a good reminder that the media only sees a portion of these practices and we could be missing key developments that will eventually show themselves on Saturdays. Which sophomore do you think has the best chance at a breakout season in 2023? And Fuller dropped everything that spring it was just well, like, he still dropped a little bit <laughs> yeah yeah he, he would he would he would put 15 touchdowns in with his drops yeah. so it was a little different uh which sophomore that's that's a great question um i mean i, I can't say his name i've already said it once and people are gonna act like i think he's starting no matter what there is uh i think Jaden mickey has taken the biggest step forward because i i know Jaden mickey uh i just feel like he is a legit college corner now where it last year it was oh he's good for a freshman or he'll be good for a freshman and when in reality he was very vulnerable Jaden mickey last year they got him out of nickel they put him as backup field remember he was cam hart's backup and when cam hart missed that usc game i know that's not fair to mickey because you sent him out there against caleb williams and 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 those yeah. Guys. yeah in ohio state those those are tough matchups but i really like Jaden mickey i should say offensively Holden stays it's not that I didn't think he would be a good player it's just he looks like he could be a weapon this year like Holden stays I like Mitch Levins the solid all-around player I like Holden stays in the passing game this year okay last question before we let you go uh your background is really interesting to me because you went to Notre Dame and you were a fan of the team before you started covering them um and one of my favorite things about you and Tim Priester as well is that you remain objective in all of your analysis despite the background you're not there to provide fan service, and you don't. But how would you describe your emotional attachment to the wins and losses today compared to when you first started doing this for a living? Well, it's much different. Like uh, 2006, I lived in Atlanta. I was flying home for some – I don't know why. No, I was flying out for a trip for Sunday morning, and I was watching the Michigan State game in the rain when Notre Dame was getting killed by Michigan State, and they came back and won. I was so mad, I just like walked away and, and couldn't – possibly watch the game play by no my, my, you missed the wife, trail Amber? yeah oh, no. but my now wife my girlfriend then was watching it in my apartment and she's like i mean this is awesome you gotta come in here I was like i can't come <laughs> i can't come in they're coming back i can't come in i can't watch anymore so that I was that type of fan now it takes uh a run like i remember pete sampson and i and pete didn't grow up in Notre Dame fan or anything like that we were sitting in the press box uh in 2012 and they were playing usc they're, they're 11 to 0 and it was just so incredible that notre dame was about to play for a national championship remember at that point it's going to play Alabama they were number one and Brian Kelly was like 
Theo Riddick was unstoppable in the game, and they get first and goal, and all I have to do is score a touchdown, and it's sealed. Yeah, and he ran four straight times with Everett Golson in the line. I'm like, just give him the ball. I mean, like screaming. That was like the one time I think I remember being in a press box thinking, "Are you smoking? What are you doing?" Like, and, and, and so people like looking around and laughing because a lot of people do that in the press box. I do not. I could just sit there and watch a game and barely move. So if Notre Dame is in the running for something, I get pretty into it. Um, the Clemson game 2020. This is a good story because I watched it from my basement. We could only bring one right. person. And Priester pulled seniority on me. Of course, I don't blame him for that one. The Clemson COVID game. So I'm in my basement sitting down. I had a uh, non-adult beverage, as far as everybody knows, while getting ready to do the game, doing all of my exact charts, this whole thing. And Kyron Williams on that first run for the touchdown is the the last time and one of the maybe the only times in 15 years I screamed during a Notre Dame game. Like, I could not believe they started the game with Kyron Williams running off that 75-yard touchdown. So... I still can get into it. I don't in the press box. Uh, if Notre Dame is playing LSU for the national title this year, I may make a sound or two in the press box. <laughs> that, that, would, that would be something else, probably. I'm glad you mentioned that because I was going to ask you a follow-up. Has there ever been a moment uh, where you were so captivated that you let out your inner fan? But it sounds like it did happen. But he is Tim O'Malley. You can read all of his work on Irish Illustrated, and you can listen to him on the Irish Illustrated Insider Podcast. Tim, I've loved having you on. For those of you listening, you're not going to see all the technical difficulties that we had to push through yeah, to was, get to this moment. Usually it's my fault. It was not my fault no, this time. No, no. Thank you good. so much for the time, man, and hopefully we can do it again soon. Hey, I really enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, you know what? One other time, uh, because of basketball games, we used to be on the feet on the court. I remember Luke yeah. Herringoti up three with three seconds left, intentionally fouled a West Virginia player uh, when he was going to the basket to lay it in. And I just gave him one of these. <laughs> <laughs> that is more of the sports fan in me saying yeah. you should not do that, though. So that's one of those didn't happen at all last year watching the quarterback play. Maybe yeah, against well, Cal. No, I, expect, I expect a lot of those things to happen. I do think. Uh, <laughs> I kind of love the Duke loss in 2016. I kind of laughed during most of it because I predicted Duke would win. And I started feeling very confident in myself. And uh, there were some offended Notre Dame fans that are writers next to me during that game. But I was just kind of smiling. Look at the Duke thing. Like, this is the most ridiculous team I've ever seen out here in my entire life. So I can go. I have that in me now. I have enough. I'm a, I'm a cynic now as well. So if Notre Dame yeah. is one in three losing to Duke, I can just laugh. It's fine. Hey, man, that's what happens. Years of being a fan will do that to you. Yes. All right, man. Take it easy. Thanks. Really enjoyed it, Tyler. Thank you. All right, that'll do it for this episode of Locked On Irish. Thanks again for making this your first listen of the day. Before you go, please subscribe to the show on YouTube or wherever you're listening to the podcast and follow the show on Twitter at Locked On Irish, on Instagram at Locked On Irish Pod, and my personal Twitter account at Tyler, W-O-J-C-I-A-K. I'll see you guys tomorrow.